afternoon. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I'm Good Beth afternoon. Keller from the Highland Park Public Library. I'm joined by my colleagues Raz Topolsky at Vernon Area Public Library and Kate Condiff at Algonquin Area Public Library. We would like to welcome you to today's program, Ukraine's Art and Architecture Under Mortal Threat. We're pleased to welcome art historian Konstantin Akinsha. Today's special program is presented by a partnership of your public libraries and is hosted by Algonquin Area Public Library, Cook Memorial Public Library, Ela Area Public Library, Glencoe Public Library, Highland Park Public Library, and Vernon Area Public Library. Please note that today's event is being recorded. The recording can be accessed in the next few days at each of the library's YouTube channels. As an attendee today, your microphone and camera are turned off. Closed captioning has been enabled. You can turn on or off the closed captioning by clicking on the live transcription icon or more icon at the bottom of your screen. Following today's event, there'll be a question and answer session. You can submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and typing in your questions. Please feel free to input your questions into the Q&A throughout the presentation. My colleague, Kate Cundiff, will moderate the question and answer session. I'd now like to turn it over to Raz Topolsky to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Um, yeah, I just want to tell everyone a little bit about our guests for today. Um, Constant Akinsha is an art historian, curator, and an expert on art expropriated during World War II. Among his books is Beautiful Loot, the Soviet Plunder of Europe's Art Treasure. He studied at the Shevenko Art School in Kiev, Ukraine, and in 1986 completed a master's in art history at the Moscow State University in Russia. He obtained his candidate of art history at the Research Institute of Art History in Moscow in 1990 and started a PhD at the University of Andrews in Scotland in 2005. He has been curator at the Museum of Western and Oriental Art in Kiev, Ukraine, and he was a European correspondent for Art News and a contributing editor to the magazine for many news for many years. His work is often uh, many many years because <laughs> it was actually was going um, until the moment Art News was sold and basically ceased to exist in the mm -hmm. old form. Mm -hmm. Which was, um, I think, 2015, 2016, when uh, unfortunately the old art news stopped to exist. So I want to tell everyone a little bit about also about your work in the United States because while he's based in Europe, he um, constantly spent a lot of time in the United States as well. Um, while, in the, while in Washington, D.C., um, he was the Deputy Research Director, Art and Cultural Property for the Presidential Advisory Commission on Holocaust Assets in the United States. He was also a Eugene and Davmel Schlar Fellow at the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard, and also spent some time in Chicago. He was a guest curator at the Art Institute for three years, and has also taught and done research um, on the East Coast, New York, Boston, Maryland. So um, we're really pleased to have him with us today. His, his current work was brought to our attention when he was published in the Wall Street Journal earlier this month on this topic. And so we reached out to get a chance to learn from him about his knowledge and his experience about the situation in Ukraine. So Constantine, I just wanna welcome you to our webinar. And I guess I thought just before you started and talking about um, what's happening, I thought maybe you could just tell us, where are you right now? Where are you based? Yeah, in the moment I am in Budapest, and um, I am uh, basically living in Italy and partly in Hungary. My mother lives in Hungary, and um, uh, in reality, I'm traveling all the time, and um, uh, it's project by project basis because I just spent two years in Germany being a fellow in Max Weber Club in Erfurt, so very often. I'm spending time everywhere, but not in my home, so. Okay. And I know you're gonna get into kind of what's happening in Ukraine right now, but I know you're also very close to this subject and you know a lot of people that are directly impacted by this situation. And so I just wanted to ask, you know, how are you? How are you? This sounds like a very personal 
and close thing, to, you know, to be dealing with. So I just, how, how is, how are you doing? Uh, you know, it's very difficult. It's very difficult from an emotional point of view. And I can give you an example because now I'm trying to do, I postponed everything what I was doing. Um, I basically temporarily put all projects on ice and I'm fully concentrated on uh, Ukrainian projects and attempts to help uh, in practical way in attempts to, you know, to attract attention to the uh, cultural destruction because uh, I feel now that I am writing an article a day, I'm publishing uh, these articles in all possible newspapers from the United States to Germany, the UK, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I want to give you one example that very often it's just difficult to, you know, to keep composure, to react normally because uh, I have a funny situation because a few years ago, I started to talk to the National Gallery of Scotland about possibility of big exhibition on Ukrainian modernism. And of course, this exhibition had to be realized in collaboration with the National Museum of Ukraine. Uh, you can imagine it's a big museum. It's a very long process. We exchange in proposals. And finally, we planned meeting with the um, uh, museum curators and directors, which was planned the month in advance. And the meeting coincided with the second day of the bombing of Kyiv. What I could tell them, I said that unfortunately our plan doesn't work anymore. We don't know what will happen to this collection. Uh, we have fully changed it. And I came with a plan B and plan B is that we will do this exhibition, but without works from Ukraine. We will take works from private collections in the West, from European collections and American museum collections, but we will do it. And now we already have a uh, museum Kiss in Barnemisa in Madrid, uh, Museo Nazionale, Museum Ludwig Museum in Köln, who for sure are joining this exhibition and we are searching for other venues. And I think that very soon we will have three, four venues and we'll be ready to roll. But I thought that, you know, even when it's impossible to take works from the National Museum of Ukraine, it could be nice to involve them even on symbolical line to write that we are <clears throat> doing this in cooperation with them. So I'm trying to reach the director and I'm getting the director 30 minutes after she launched that her cousin was <laughs> summarily executed uh, on the outskirts of Kyiv. Because many people in uh, Kyiv who are not military are going to so-called territorial defense, which is a basically self-defense mm -hmm. units. Uh, can you imagine my conversation with this director? It's yeah. horrible. And <clears throat> I have to say that uh, many people in museums, many people in institutions are behaving fully heroically. Uh, unfortunately, and we will return to this issue, uh, many museums in Ukraine were not evacuated for different reasons. We will discuss these reasons. And now collections are the best case taken downstairs and uh, packed and stored in cellars. So directors and curators are basically living in the cellar. They, they cannot leave them because if they will go home, it's, uh, they cannot return back in case of emergency because it's, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, you cannot walk at night, it's a martial rule. So they live in the cellars. Like uh, in one of the biggest museum of Ukraine, which I don't want to mention the day, uh, five women barricaded themselves in this cellar. They bought a lot of food, water, etc., And they are sitting there. They're not going out because they close the door so good that they can come out. And uh, I'm talking to them and saying, what are you doing? Because so what you will do, if Russians will come, how you will defend this art? But they are staying there. And uh, it's, of course, extremely, extremely dangerous situation. We will talk about these dangers. And uh, I want to start 
um, uh, this conversation uh, describing you situation in museums. Uh, and this situation is um, uh, extremely great. I have to come back to- Okay, so I'm gonna turn off my camera and then turn things over to you as you share your slides. And we'll be back at the end. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, uh, um, uh, we will start with, um, you already mentioned that uh, some time ago, I published an article in the Wall Street Journal, which was dedicated to the problem of um, evacuation of museum collections. Uh, I published it before the war came, the shade which it came today. Unfortunately, um, it was impossible to evacuate museum collections of Ukraine. Uh, and this impossibility is understandable. We are talking about uh, hundreds of thousands of objects and numerous cities. Of course, some cities were cut out in the very beginning, like for example, Kharkiv. And we will return to the Kharkiv Museum a bit later. But um, uh, museums of Kyiv practically were not evacuated. And one of the reasons was that before the beginning of the war, I think that Ukrainian leadership made a mistake. Uh, those of you who were following political developments probably remember that at some moment, President Zelensky even uh, started to bicker with President Biden saying that Americans are uh, coming daily with doom and gloom scenarios. And in reality, the situation is not so bad. So uh, evacuation was not realized because in that moment, the officials believed that uh, if we will start to move museum collections, it will provoke panic. So panic did not happen, but the collections were not evacuated either. And we have, um, I can give you one only, for example, let's talk about Kyiv. There are of course other museums and Kyiv has uh, all it all more than 30 museums. There are museums of all possible types, but some of them are extremely important. You see on the screen this uh, golden skis and uh, pectoral breastplate, uh, which is in the collection of Museum of Ukrainian National Museum of uh, Historical Treasures. This museum have the best collections of skis and gold, but many other things which are coming from early history to 19th century. Uh, it's uh, roughly 75,000 objects. Uh, we have National Museum of Ukrainian Art, which is full of ontological examples of Ukrainian art. Masterpieces starting with, um, uh, you know, early medieval icons and uh, finishing with um, uh, Ukrainian avant-garde of the 20th century. Uh, it's the, uh, it is not evacuated yet. All the collections are in the cellar of the museum and the museum is nicely located basically in stone throw from the building of the cabinet of ministers and uh, from the uh, presidential administration, which obviously are targets of choice uh, for um, uh, Russian missile attacks. I think that one of the reasons why this evacuation was not realized uh, also was that nobody, nobody, I think that even people who had access to intelligence, etc., could imagine that this war will take such shape. Nobody could imagine that Russians will bomb uh, and uh, shell cities uh, with population from one to three million. You understand that it's not any kind of precise uh, shelling, it's just uh, dropping bombs and uh, shooting rockets without even um, uh, thinking about targets. So it's a absolutely horrible situation, but situation is horrible not only in Kyiv, it's horrible in the other cities too. And uh, to give you some examples, uh, 
I want to uh, show you some situations uh, like in the city of Kharkiv. You uh, probably read a lot about Kharkiv. Uh, Kharkiv uh, now is nicknamed the Ukrainian Stalingrad. Uh, it's very interesting because we cannot find any other comparisons uh, than comparisons from the Second World War history. So Kharkiv became Ukrainian Stalingrad. Uh, uh, Mariupol is um, uh, very often uh, referred as a um, uh, siege of Leningrad reincarnated. So uh, Kharkiv is the uh, second biggest city in Ukraine, which has um, uh, interesting museum collections, especially uh, Museum of uh, Fine Arts, uh, which is uh, you know big collection mainly of Russian art. What is a paradoxical because uh, one of uh, officially declared objectives of the Putin's war uh, against uh, uh, Ukraine uh, was a kind of liberation of Russian speaking population from uh, Ukrainian yoke. So far, the cities which were mostly damaged are uh, the cities with predominantly Russian population and many of cultural monuments which were damaged are uh, monuments which are connected mainly with Russian culture. Uh, in uh, Kharkiv, the um, uh, museum fortunately was not fully destroyed. Uh, the explosion happened near it. It just lost practically all windows. You can see this on the screen, I hope. And uh, uh, the irony of the situation was that museum staff was not even able to remove paintings from the walls before this attack. Because another thing which you have to keep in mind, Ukraine is Ukraine. It's not rich country. We are not talking about German or Swiss of American museums. We, uh, these museums are usually understaffed. A uh, minority of staff are women, uh, sometimes aged, and they just have no possibility to remove, uh, even to remove paintings from the wall. So after this Kharkiv Museum was damaged, uh, it was, many of volunteers came, uh, and uh, only with their help, collection could be packed and moved somewhere in relatively secure place, but security of this place is very questionable. So the parody of the situation, the, the main part of the collection of this museum are uh, basically extremely important paintings of Russian art, as for example, um, uh, this painting of Ilya Repin depicting uh, Ukrainian Cossacks uh, writing a letter to the Turkish Sultan. Uh, Finally, after uh, this incident, the director of the museum, Valentina Mizgina, came with very good comment. And she was, of course, shocked. She is Russian speaking, she is uh, Russian ethnically. And she said that never in her life she could imagine that she will be obliged to protect uh, Russian classical paintings from Russian shells. Yeah, that's the situation. And the situation is that uh, what we are facing, we really did not face in the Second World War. We are facing a methodical destruction of cities, uh, which could be compare, um, compare it to, I don't know, to Rotterdam, to Guernica. Uh, it's um, uh, up to you. I wanted to show you, uh, and it's, uh, kind of uh, absolutely shocking and uh, um, one second I have to find it. Uh, it's a very uh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. So 
I just want to show you random destruction of the city of Kharkiv. Of course, everybody paid a lot of attention uh, to the destruction of uh, uh, and danger of destruction of constructivist monuments. Uh, Kharkiv uh, is a city of uh, modern architecture. Uh, basically, uh, part of it was uh, constructed in the beginning of the 20th century, but after the revolution, it became uh, an important uh, center because uh, from 1917 to 1920 uh, to, uh, to 1934, it was the capital of the Soviet Ukraine. So it was a showcase, the city of um, uh, gigantic constructivist buildings, which uh, had to uh, celebrate uh, Soviet modernity. Uh, and in a sense, it was uh, used like counterweight to the ancient architecture of the city of Kiev. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, if constructivist buildings are very known and they have probably more of uh, international value and provoking interest, the um, uh, architecture of the beginning of the 20th century is interesting too, it's important. Uh, and in front of you is a house, which is on the list of Ukrainian national monuments, which was constructed. Constantine, you know, right now the image that we're seeing is still from your blog. I don't think you're sharing. Uh, 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 uh. Sorry, sorry. You please That's correct okay. me. Yeah. You please correct me. Because... I'll, I'll stick around until we get that right one up. Yeah. Uh, wait, are you... Can you can you see it? Oh, now we can see the pictures of the of the buildings. Yes. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Thank I you. want to uh, I want to take you through a short excursion from uh, through Kharkiv today. So this building is um, uh, it's a, uh, probably not the most important architectural treasure, but uh, for me it's very sad because uh, it's still on the list of the. Uh, uh, monuments of um, uh, Ukrainian uh, architectural heritage. And many of these buildings of Belle Epoque now are destroyed uh, even more than constructivist architecture. Uh, in the moment, um, uh, I am working with a photographer from Kharkiv who uh, saw my blog, contacted me and uh, told me that he wants to make a project. He is documenting every day new destructions of Kharkiv buildings. And uh, I'm trying to help him because he urgently needs a bulletproof vest and a helmet because uh, uh, he's working in a very dangerous situation and these shells are falling around him. So that's what you can see today in Kharkiv. Uh, you see, it's building after building, it's destruction after destruction. Uh, it's really horrible. This is, for example, is a very important building of the beginning of the 20th century. It was constructed, uh, finished in 1916, one of few buildings which they continued to construct during the First World War. And it was a gigantic luxury house uh, which tenant house, which uh, belonged in that moment to the uh, insurance company called Russia. Uh, and uh, after the revolution, it was used as a, a seat of the People's Commissariat of Labor and was nicknamed the Palace of Labor. So, I'm sorry. Uh, and this building was uh, fully and completely uh, destroyed uh, during the last attacks. It's, um, it's a shame. It's a uh, building important in architectural sense. And uh, you can see how it looks inside now. This is the interior. This is a constructivist building, which is a part of the university. And you see its shape too. But it's building after building. Uh, we are going through the very central part of Kharkiv. This is the interiors of this palace of labor. In the window, you can see uh, the building of um, uh, so-called 
uh, Der Sprung, um, uh, building of state industry, which uh, is the biggest constructive is building in the Soviet Union, if not in the world. It was a huge complex on the central square of Kharkiv. It's already damaged too. It still was not uh, directly by the Russian rockets, but it is not in very good shape. So we have uh, streets and streets and streets and streets. It's, it's absolutely uh, merciless, horrible destruction of the city, important cultural center. And uh, that's the situation in which Ukraine lives today. So uh, what could be done in this situation? It's absolutely unclear. Uh, I think that uh, uh, there are many <coughs> efforts to somehow provide help, but uh, unfortunately, it's not clear how this help could be provided. In the moment, uh, the best which international community is trying to do is uh, uh, to uh, collect packing materials. These materials are collected in the city of uh, um, uh, Krakow and to deliver the city is these materials to the um, uh, uh, deliver these this materials to the uh, Polish Ukrainian border. Uh, different monuments are constantly under attack. These monuments could be uh, uh, little um, uh, local museums, like, like this little museum uh, in uh, Aktirka, little village not far from Sumy, which is a, you know, what we are calling in German Heimat Museum, uh, with a collection of uh, local historical collections. Uh, collections of folk art, and here you can see what is left of it. That could be religious monument because it's strange because uh, we have um, uh, permanent Russian attacks uh, on the religious buildings. I am not sure that it's done on purpose, but it's happening. Uh, uh, this is a uh, monastery, very beautiful monastery, stunningly beautiful monastery. Uh, I cannot say that it's super important architecturally. It's uh, old, but uh, uh, all the buildings of the beginning of uh, 16th century were reconstructed in the 19th century. There are st still parts of, the, uh, of it which are quite valuable as an architectural legacy. So this monastery was shelled recently. It was damaged. Uh, you can see the damage. Uh, the problem was that uh, not only destruction of architecture, of course, this destruction is uh, highly important, but we are talking about human to human lives. And the monastery was a refuge for numerous refugees, among uh, whom were many children. Uh, many, many children, some of these children were wounded, and the story is repeating and repeating every day. Now we're facing another very uh, uh, tragic and dangerous situation because um, uh, from one hand, I told you about Kyiv. Kyiv is constantly attacked, it's constantly bombed and uh, um, many military analysts um, believe that unfortunately, uh, Russians could try to storm the city. If they will try to store the city, of course, it will be horrible. I don't know what we can um, uh, say about the fate of the cultural property, about the fate of monasteries, architectural monuments, museums. This is absolutely unpredictable. But uh, uh, there are other cities, and we have a very serious situation in the southern part of the country. Uh, you probably read, if you are following the news, if you are watching uh, a daily report uh, from Ukraine, you read about Mariupol, which I already mentioned. 
the city now practically doesn't exist anymore. It, uh, it was a medium-sized city uh, with mixed uh, Ukrainian and Greek population. It was probably the biggest community of ethnic Greeks in Ukraine. And uh, it's, uh, the city basically is uh, more or less contemporary. There, is, there are elements of uh, 19th century um, uh, surviving quarters. And uh, it was one museum, it's a little museum, but it was a very charming museum and the nice Belle Epoque Villa. Uh, it was again uh, dedicated to Russian artists. Uh, the name of this artist is Arkip Quinj. He was of Greek descent and became extremely important uh, in the in mid 19th century. He was a landscape painter uh, with uh, some touch of magic color. It was even discussion how he is making his painting so luminous and that he probably has some secret. Uh, this is a uh, version of the famous painting, The Red uh, Sunset on the Dnieper. And uh, the actual painting, it's a, I can say that it's a sketch or the first version. The actual version of this painting is in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Uh, I'm not sure that it's uh, exhibited, but it's in their collection. So this museum doesn't exist anymore. I don't know if this painting survived. I don't know what is left of it because the building was bombed, that area was bombed. We don't have information from the city. The city is cut out. Uh, uh, it's in siege. Russians are not letting uh, out refugees. And of course, nobody cares now about this museum and could this painting survive under the ruins because uh, people have absolutely different objectives. And, uh, but this is done, this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is already destroyed. But uh, one of the main concerns which we have, and <coughs> this is a very serious concern. It's a situation in Odessa. <coughs> uh, it's a legendary city. It's a very big cultural center. It's a uh, crossroad of all possible cultures. You know, it's a, traditionally was the main Jewish city of Ukraine. It's city with a Greek minority, still with the Italian minority, which is still the German minority, Armenian minority, just name the name. Tatars, Ukrainians, Russians, everything which you can imagine. And, um, it's a central part of the city. It's a beautiful early 19th century classicist part. So what will happen with this, uh, with this part? This monument, which you see now filed with uh, um, sandbags, it's a symbol of Odessa. It's a monument to the fifth Duke of Richelieu, who was an uh, emigrant from the revolutionary France. Uh, who was the uh, governor of the city during the days of Alexander I. Uh, so, will these sandbags protect the monument in case of uh, um, Russian missile attack? I don't know. And uh, you can see that the image is iconic and it really looks like surrealist painting and uh, something which could be probably created by the Kirika but it's difficult to imagine this in real. Odessa, of course, has not only architectural monuments, <coughs> it has quite a few important museums, <coughs> uh, beautiful museum of uh, fine art, mainly concentrated on Russian and Ukrainian art, an important museum of uh, Western and Oriental art, which includes uh, masterpieces of uh, Franz Hals, such as <coughs> two, portrait, two um, uh, images of uh, Evangelist uh, of Mark and Matthew, and uh, the third painting is in the Getty Museum in LA. Uh, did uh, Odessa people have time to evacuate these paintings? I'm not sure. 
Uh, I hope that yes, but uh, much like with a still sitting in the cellar of the museum. So is hierarchy with the crime which already happened, Odessa is standing in line. Uh, Russians are obviously preparing to for landing. All the museums and this beautiful square are situated in the proximity of the seaport, which will be the first target of the Russian attack. Uh, so we can only can brace for horrible news. This is the main thing <coughs> which we are now facing. Of course, uh, as I told you, international community is trying uh, to activate, uh, to offer something to Ukraine. <coughs> but I hope that at some moment, the uh, Ukrainian government will understand that these treasures, anyway, those treasures who are in safety now, and we have only relatively safe place in the country, which in the moment is the city of Lviv, which is, uh, uh, beautiful ancient European city. It was changing hands many times, which um, uh, belonged to Kingdom of Poland, belonged to Austria Hungary, etc. We hope that um, uh, the city will be not destroyed. We hope that that area will be not bombed. But recently, Russians already a few times attacks vicinities of Lviv, it was more attacks against military installation and airports, but nobody said that they will not attack the city. So I hope that the government will decide, and it's my plea to the government, that it's necessary to evacuate certain collections which are in Lviv and move them to the storage of European museums. I think that European museums are quite open for such possibility and uh, ready to help. In, in this very moment, everybody ready to help. There are many initiatives. Uh, you probably heard about American initiatives to help with, uh, um, uh, let's say, preserving digital archives of the museums. But the problem is that not so many museums in Ukraine have digital archives. So um, uh, we will see what will happen. Uh, I want to add one thing because, uh, of course, uh, we are concentrating. Stunning collection of extremely rare books, start, starting with the medieval manuscripts and going up. All of this in one storage. The storage uh, is uh, relatively contemporary, like uh, eight-ish concrete building, which will not withstand any serious uh, bombardment. So, what will happen with this stuff? And also, I want to address one other issue, uh, which is the um, situation with Jewish legacy. Because, uh, you know, Jewish legacy of Ukraine, which was uh, probably the most Jewish part of the Russian Empire, uh, it was uh, practically all of the country was in the pale of settlement. It was the biggest Jewish population. Uh, they uh, was extremely strongly damaged during the Second World War and during the Soviet period when um, uh, after the war we had sometimes off and sometimes badly hidden uh, anti-Semitic campaigns. So the synagogues was closed. Uh, used for different purposes. Uh, I can give you a peculiar example because when I was basically a child in Kyiv, I was going to the choral synagogue 
frequently and to the Karim Synagogue once a week. Uh, in Coral Synagogue was a puppet theater and uh, in the Karim Synagogue was a cinema house. So that's what happened to uh, uh, Jewish legacy during the Soviet days. After the, in the, after the independence of Ukraine, uh, Jewish life reached on to uh, certain normality, if not to say very active form. Uh, communities were formed, rabbis, uh, sorry, rabbis arrived from um, uh, mainly from America and Israel. Uh, synagogues were restored. So it became like quite vibrant Jewish life. Now, these remains of the Jewish legacy, which uh, were restored and attracted attention, are on the full swing. I don't want to mention, probably all of you knew that uh, Russians succeeded even to bomb Bob in Yar. Uh, that was not made of purpose. They were uh, aiming uh, into the Kyiv TV tower, but anyway, the bomb exploded on the territory of the memorial complex. But uh, they're not on, uh, only aiming for it because uh, we already read reports about bombardments of uh, the city of Uman, which is a Hasidic capital of Ukraine, if not of the world, because the rabbi of Bratislav is buried there. Now, fortunately, they did not aim yet. Uh, his grave, but they succeeded to destroy Shiva there. The city of Zhitomir, which is now the very important historical Jewish center, is under constant bombardment. And it has a lot of uh, uh, important 19th century buildings connected with the Jewish life. In Zhitomir, they just recently, just recently succeeded to um, uh, uh, restore um, ancient synagogue. It did not survive too much, only the frontal wall survived, but they nicely restored it, and now, of course, it's damaged. So I am afraid that um, uh, this heritage, which was not well preserved and now was rediscovered became a part of Jewish life. Now, again, is in the danger of complete elimination. So that I what, what I wanted to tell you, and uh, maybe we can move to the questions. Hello? <laughs> Yeah, I think Kate, are you going to join for the questions? Yeah, I I think that. You're... Yeah. Yeah, we're all ready to go. Constantine, thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate um, your time and all the effort you put into this. Um, we do have some questions, and I want to quickly remind people that we are still accepting questions. Feel free to use the Q and A feature um, to submit them to us, and we'll get them to Constantine. Um, before we do so, though, I just wanted to quickly mention that a poll is going to appear on your screen for 10 to 15 seconds. Um, we just want to get a feel for how many folks are watching at home today. So you can take just a minute to answer that. And while Roz is displaying that, we're going to move into our first question. Um, Constantine, based on experience following previous wars, how can a museum or a country um, rebuild its art collection? You know, it's a, it's a very interesting question because, uh, for example, what we are facing now, uh, we don't know yet because to be precise, Russians did not succeed yet to uh, destroy major museums. We have, of course, the first case of looting because um, uh, a museum in provincial but very stunning country estate was looted by Russian soldiers. It's not any kind of uh, premeditated, well organized removal of museum collections by special forces of the country. It was just a random robbery. They carried out everything which they could leave. Uh, but, <clears throat> uh, you know, 
including some important and uh, um, uh, valuable uh, objects for local history. But what will happen in the big cities? What we, we still, uh, um, uh, you know, Putin forces uh, were marching to Ukraine for Blitzkrieg and were planning to take Kiev in three days. So far, they cannot take the city of Mariupol, which they already uh, turned into the into the rock. So I not so much I'm not so much afraid of removal of museum collections. However, of course, we have a danger. We obviously have a danger because uh, the city of Kherson, it's only city, relatively big city, occupied by Russians. And Kherson has a decent museum with again collection of Russian art with uh, few uh, um, uh, with few uh, paintings by uh, Ivazovsky, who was very important seascape painter, uh, um, uh, valuable for Russian culture. What they will do with this museum, we don't know yet, because they cannot subjugate the city. They want to create the puppet republic, but every day population is going with protests, organizing meetings, et cetera, et cetera, and clashing with the Russian force. So we don't know what will happen there. But what I am afraid, which I already mentioned, it's um, uh, just um, uh, artillery hit, explosion of bomb, stray rocket going, either into the museum or into the monument of architecture. What we will do if a bomb will fall on the uh, St. Sophia Cathedral with its exclusive Byzantine mosaics? We cannot reconstruct it. That will be gone. Maybe we can um, uh, reconstruct the building. Of course, it will become a fake. It will be you know, a new building. We had the story with, uh, you know, probably in Dresden, Marie and Kirche, which after reunification was composed of little stone fragments. It looks like real church, but it's not the real church anymore. But what, how to replace museum collections? There is no way for this. If Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian uh, national museum will be destroyed, there is no replacement. And uh, what we are say, seeing here and what I want to say it's not just a crime against Ukraine, it's a crime against world culture. And uh, we are not able to stop it now because uh, all attempts of Ukrainians to negotiate with the Russian government, all attempts of President Biden somehow to stop this war, not going into the um, uh, closing uh, of Ukrainian sky and announcing a non-fly zone are not helping, it's continuing. So there is no replacement. I, I don't believe that Ukraine will use Russian uh, strategy of confiscating the Russian collections in the case of victory and replacing the lost Ukrainian um, art records. You cannot confiscate, you cannot uh, there are no ways to, um, uh, you know, to uh, exchange what will be destroyed or, or what will be theoretically could be taken from other museums. That's the main question. There is no way to replace it. No replacement. Great, thank you. So I know you spoke on this a little, but then what is being done now to preserve the art that, that's still in You know, the main, the, main, the main thing, and of course I cannot give you all the examples. In some cases, I just not um, uh, uh, in freedom to tell what was done because we, this information has to be um, not disclosed, but um, some museum directors made unbelievable things. Like uh, uh, in one museum uh, director who is a relatively young woman, uh, Russian shelling, the first Russian shelling on the first day of war started in five o'clock in the morning. Six o'clock in the morning, all the stuff was in the museum. Uh, nothing was done before this, unfortunately, but uh, anyway. So all of them are there. They understand that they cannot do it by themselves. So they starting to work phones, 
And this museum is connected, it's a collection of old art, but contemporary art too. So they drafted all contemporary artists in the city. All these artists came. And one day they packed all this museum fully. They worked like from six o'clock in the morning to the deep night, everything was packed. Everything was moved to the relatively safe storages. Of course, and in the end of the day, in a couple of weeks, they succeeded to evacuate majority of this collection, majority, not everything, but majority of the most valuable things to be. So that was perfect. But in general, only, only way which is available now, you know, pray to God that your museum has a deep cellar. If you have a deep cellar, you are already kind of winner, which depends, of course, on the type of bomb which will uh, uh, fall on your roof. Because if, it's, uh, if it will be half a ton bomb for destruction of fortifications, your cellar will not save. Yeah, so packing, moving, storing in the cellar, it's praying to God that uh, it will be safe. Because now, you know, it was still like, week, two weeks ago, it was possible to move these collections to the west of the country. Now you can imagine the situation, a convoy of trucks, like car, usually like very colorful yeah, trucks for, uh, with logos for uh, shipment of art, it's an obvious target for any plane. And to run them through for kilometers and kilometers for, uh, you know, miles and miles through the whole country, it's just impossible. It's impossible also because of the state of the road, because of some roads were already blocked. So you have to protect them where you are. And uh, of course, there are shortages of everything I mentioned already today that Western museums are trying to deliver um, uh, emergency help, taking materials. Uh, it was a funny situation because I'm participating in these different groups who are dealing with this uh, story. It's like a phone call from uh, uh, the city of the Paris and they're saying we have to protect the sculptures and we have sand, but we have no bags. Can you find us bags? So how we can find sitting in, I don't know, London, Berlin, etc. bags for the Parisian? It's another story. We found these bags because it was a question of paying money. We did it. But uh, it's a daily problems. And uh, again, I'm uh, impressed by heroic conduct of many museum officials who are doing this. It's, it's, it's really stunning. It's, Thank you for your thoughtful answer. Um, you had mentioned while you were um, talking and showing us parts of your blog about um, Ukraine's Jewish legacy. And there's a lot of questions here from participants that wanna know, um, have the Jewish synagogues been bombed or destroyed? Is, are there any efforts being made to protect the Torahs? What can you tell us about that? I, I can tell you about this and uh, I now I, you know, I have no minute, but I want really maybe this weekend to find some time and to write about Jewish legacy in them. Because uh, first, we have a lot of Jewish material in museums. Uh, it's one story. But another uh, situation is with uh, synagogue with Jewish community. I want to put on my screen one photograph, which uh, not just about uh, culture, but about which is a which could be kind of partial answer. I'm sorry, I'm trying to escape from here. It's, it's important photograph. Uh, uh, one second, it's uh, for me. It's very important. I know people who are photographed, so. Uh, but I will continue to answer your question when I'm searching for this photograph. Uh, what to do? Of course, um, uh, communities are taking extremely active effort in defense of Ukraine. 
it's uh, extremely um, uh, stunning to which extent Ukrainian jewelry is demonstrating <coughs> patriotic feelings. Many people are going into the army. I can give you just one example what's going on in Dnipro, which is one of the biggest Jewish community in Ukraine. It's a city with, uh, uh, this is a photograph which I wanted to show you. Uh, it's a synagogue of Dnipro. I'm sorry, I've become a little walker. So, these people are going to the front. I'm very sorry. Wait, um, um, Rabbi Asher Cherkovsky, who is a military chaplain in the Ukrainian army, and, and he saw David. And these people are going bizarre to fight. Uh, for me, it was simply very difficult. I am very, I am very sorry because it's too emotionally difficult to talk about all of this. So these these people do it all they can, and of course, uh, we have our, all our members where they help to be because. Rabbi of Dipro is in Dipro and Rabbi of Kiev is in Kiev. Of course, they're trying to save Doras, etc. But to which extent it will be possible? Well, we, we don't know this. And uh, for example, the Kharkiv synagogue is already damaged. Uh, it was not direct hit, but the uh, explosion was near the synagogue. Uh, the interior is damaged, all windows are out, everything is broken. And I am very, very nervous about this because uh, it's horrible, horrible situation. Uh, again, sorry for my emotional this. I, I, I could not sustain myself. So, uh, of course, now uh, I think some things will be evacuated uh, from. Uh, I know that um, uh, Hasidim organized evacuation from uh, Dnipro. They took old people, children. Sorry. Don't apologize. Yeah. Don't so apologize. We, will, we will see what will happen. But. Uh, uh, the danger is very high. And uh, for me, it's very painful. Is it's a very painful thing that, you know, we just, we started it. Because it's Jewish life started too. Well, again, don't feel the need to apologize. We, uh, we yeah, sorry. I, 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 I composed my friend, sorry. No worries. It's, it's, it's an emotional time for a lot of people. Um, we got lots of questions and lots of interest um, from our attendees here today, but at this time we are going to wrap up. Uh, Constantine, we thank you so much for um, making this work on such short notice and um, giving us some insight into what's going on. Um, I want to welcome back Roz and Beth to help me say goodbye. And I want to, if I, <laughs> if I will be permitted, I am very grateful to you. I think that we have to talk about it. I think that people have to know about it. Uh, and we need awareness. We need people to understand what, what happened in the, what happened in the field. Thank you very much for your interest in this work. And thanks for, to all participants who were interested to uh, attend this talk. Thank you so much, Constantine. It was really just an honor to get to meet you and to, to talk to you and to learn about this topic. So thank you for joining us. I've put your blog in the chat so that anyone who wants to continue to follow on this topic can see. I know you update it every day or so with uh, more pictures and information about what's happening. So I encourage everyone who's watching to, to save that link and to continue to check it out so you can see um, how the situation's evolving. Um, so thank you, Constantine, for joining us. and. Thank you very much.
partners here today, um, for everyone joining us at home that kind of just took the time to just learn and kind of educate ourselves about this topic. So thank you for being with us today. Thank, thank you, Constantine. You. And thank you, Raz, for really putting this program together for all of us. And um, Constantine, there are some wonderful uh, wishes in the chat. Um, some comments that everyone is sending their best wishes in the chat. So thanks everyone for joining us and thank you, Constantine. Thank you, goodbye.